And I, I just want to take a really quick moment before we jump into the IT portion to address one or two questions that have come up that individuals have raised that I think are really relevant to everybody that it may benefit you all. Um, and one clarification that may be helpful. So very early in the day, we were talking about the medical loss ratio. You're going to start to hear that term a lot more when it comes to managed care, the MLR. And so there is a federal requirement, no matter what state you're in, that the minimum amount of your rate that you get, that you have to invest in actual provision of services is that 85% baseline. States have the ability to make that requirement even higher. And New York has chosen to do that for behavioral health services specifically. And we expect that over time that that may change, but for the next few years at least, New York has set their MLR requirement. The last number I saw was 89%. I just tried to do a little research because I've heard a lot of pushback from managed care and in different directions, and it started out at 90 and the FIDA rate is all the way as high as 94% in some cases, but the last number we're able to get, the most recent in New York for behavioral health is 89%. So that's gonna be higher than your federal requirement. And so um, just wanna kind of make that distinction because specifically so much advocacy and a lot of people in this room, I'm sure have been a part of that, has been done to make sure they're protecting the investment in behavioral health services and not letting managed care take this money that's being carved in and not spend it on behavioral health. Um, a lot of advocacy and protections in the state has really responded to that and set even more stringent requirements on managed care to invest those funds in behavioral health services. So I just wanted to make that point because I think um, our, we, our, our state com, um, compadres get a lot of flack and I know they're working really hard and they do actually really listen and respond to a lot of feedback and are able to incorporate that into what's happening. Um, the other thing that we have heard questions asked about is um, the ongoing support from the state. If you have state contracts, state, what ma many people call net deficit funding or cost-based contracts, where you have a direct contract with OASIS or OMH or, or um, one of the other agencies. And we have heard from our state folks that they are protecting that investment for now and they are not going to take that away for at least the first two years of implementation. So that, they've been out and about saying that. They've been very vocal about that. So that commitment to maintaining that level of state aid is there for now in that transition period. However, we think it's really, really important that you all think about how you monitor and track the revenue you're getting in addition to that state aid. What is not going to be okay in the long run is to con get that, continue getting that state aid continue serving the exact same number of people that you're contracted to do through OMH or OASIS, and also bill for some of those people and those services and get the revenue and in the end keep it all. That's not going to happen. Um, at some point there will be a reconciliation and likely some take backs because you can't, you still can't under any construct bill two sources of revenue for the same service to the same person. So just as you think about it, there are different ways you can tackle this and I'm happy to talk with different individuals offline if you think this is an issue for you or your agency um, about some strategies and we have made some recommendations and talked with the state about potential strategies to mitigate this but which is something really important as you move through the transition period to be aware of tracking who you're serving and with what revenue sources um, so that you're not caught unaware down the line and end up having anybody come and take money back away from you. And so um, the other uh, piece of this is that even though someone that you serve is currently getting, let's say, one of the home and community-based services, something like supported employment um, or an on-site rehab service or one, one of these um, services. If they are not deemed eligible for home and community-based services or not enrolled in a HARP, they're assessed and not found to have sufficient functional need and deficits and a utilization history that makes them eligible for the highest level of need they may be, they will still get behavioral health services. They'll still be eligible for the state plan, that list of state plan services, IPRT and CDT and, and ACT and mobile crisis and outpatient clinic. Um, 
They also could get a home and community-based service at the discretion of managed care if they ch so choose to pay you for that service. They have a mechanism that they call, and you'll hear this phrase better around, in lieu of. And so um, this is a, essentially the freedom that managed care has because they get some additional money that they don't have restrictions on that they're able to use. And if they think, you know, if we don't pay for these ongoing home and community-based services for Megan, then she's going to end up back in the hospital. Then I might as well take the money I would use to pay for that hospitalization and continue to buy her home and community-based services. And so they have the discretion to do that. They, you would have to have that arrangement with them. They would have to be in contract with you to reimburse you for those services for Megan. It's, you'll hear QHP or Qualified Health Plan. That's a plan where they've been, um, they had to respond to the big RFQ and they've been designated by the state to manage behavioral health services. They've proven they know how to do that, but they only have to cover the state plan. And the people who are enrolled in those services are not necessarily eligible for HCBS. But if they choose as an option, they can purchase HCBS as a sort of optional service for the people that they're serving. So it's not that those people are excluded completely or can never get HCBS services. So I hope that's a little bit of a clarification for folks if that came up. And there are a number of other um, questions that we're going to be reporting back to the state. As usual, things are changing and in flux, and we don't have every answer here today. Um, we, every time we hear from you on a question we don't know, we collect them, we report back and work with NYU and McTac to report back to the state and to continue to push for answers to those questions around. I heard a question about if you currently have an MMIS number, are you going to have to get another one to cover your HCBS services? We don't think so, but we're double checking that one. So I don't have a, a final answer on that. So are there any other questions that have come up throughout the course of the day that we haven't answered that folks want to quickly raise to make sure we are documenting them and addressing them? No? Everybody's in post-lunch coma. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So uh, what you were just commenting on, raise this question for me, because I assumed it was the case, but you'll tell me. Can a consumer who is HARP eligible use the state plan services like outpatient mental health and HCBS services? Yes, absolutely. Okay. They both have to be in the plan of care, but they're absolutely. So everybody in the state is eligible for state plan services, right. no matter what because that's like, like anything else, that's it's everybody, every single plan has to cover those services, no matter what your diagnosis or eligibility, but it does have to be in your plan of care. And it still has to be an authorized service, so managed care has to go through that authorization right. process. But yes, the expectation that you might go to a clinic, but then also get crisis respite and supported employment and on-site rehab, absolutely. Because I was thinking, for example, because we have outpatient clinics that are client in crisis under HCBS could potentially be eligible for the community psychiatric services on site at the person's home if needed and they were eligible for those services in addition to the clinic services that are right. approved under the state plan. Um, so the so, so because they look a little different you're right that one of the complexities between the CPST and the outpatient clinic Generally, CPST is intended, if you read the manual and the sort of description of the service, they're very similar, but it's intended for people who are unlikely to on their own to actually uh, go into an outpatient clinic and proactively seek the services. So CPST is more um, sort of if, if it's supposed to be delivered in the community for those who need that extra, you to go to them to engage them and to keep them engaged in the service. It's not a completely bright line. So I believe that's one of those nuances that's going to be worked out. But, um, but the, yeah, that's the, the sort of nuance right now that they've articulated in the manual. Sure. OK. Let me go into information technology systems. How's that? Oh, now it's on. Um, before lunch, we found out that everybody has, well, almost everybody has an EHR, which is great news. How many of you have an EHR that can do billing, scheduling, produce client data demographics, et cetera, and record all of your electronic health records? Okay, so like a, a couple of you, that's great. There, uh, I'm going to skim over EHR, and again, McTac does, um, does a much more detailed training about this that I would recommend very highly for those of you who are um, 
interested in spending the seven and a half million dollars that we heard about before lunch. Um, there is one overarching message. If you don't remember anything else that I say about IT today, there's one thing you should walk away remembering, which is that if you do your work up front, you will save yourself a lot of pain and suffering on the back end. Most of the people who have had really miserable experiences with electronic health records have had really miserable experiences with electronic health records because they didn't do their due diligence up front. Now, the state has said they're going to do a whole bunch of due diligence for you and bring you two, three, or four options to choose from. Don't just pick one of those. Don't rely on them. I'm sure they're going to do great work, and I'm sure they're going to find really great systems. But, <laughs> but, just, but just because it's a really great system doesn't mean it's going to be a really great system for you and your agency. Because every agency is different, everybody's service portfolio is different, everybody's staff are different, everybody's situation is different. So just because it's a great EHR doesn't mean it's going to be a great EHR for you. And if you lim if definitely look at the four the state come up with, especially because they're free, um, but don't limit yourself to those and don't pick one of those at random. You know, you might look at those four, and one, if one of those works for you, that's great. But the key is to do the work up front, because the cost of implementing it is very high. The cost of changing horses in the middle of the stream is astronomical, and so you really need to make sure before you put your money down, before you embed this IT structure into your organization's operations, that you have an IT system that's really going to work for you and your people. You're going to need, and ideally you're going to find one system that will do all of these things for you. Because the way the world is going, the more it's all tied together in a single package, the better it's going to be for you in terms of making sure that you're providing the right service to the right people in the right place with the right clinician, and then making sure that you're getting paid the right amount at the back end. Um, so you want to make sure that it can centralize your scheduling, that it can capture all of the clinical data that you need to capture. And the caveat here that I'll offer is that the EHR industry on the medical side is much more robust than the EHR industry on the behavioral health side. It's a lot easier to find a really good EHR for an Article 28 clinic than it is to find a really good EHR for an Article 31 clinic. And if you start talking about an Article 31 clinic and home and community-based services, it's really, really hard to find a good one. Um, and so you just need to be cognizant that it's going to capture not, not just that it captures clinical data, but that it captures the clinical data you need to capture. Your specific, unique organizational needs are accounted for. If it can help you electronically submit your claims, that will reduce your revenue cycle time and save you a lot of pain and suffering. Financial accounting, reporting capabilities, and, and this is absolutely essential. If it cannot communicate with a RIO, do not buy it. Any EHR that is not capable at this point in history of communicating with everybody else's EHR via the RIO should, you should not buy because you're, you'll trap yourself on an island. And what I think we've talked about a lot this, so far today is the importance of interface with everybody else. And so if your EHR can't communicate with everybody else, you're, you're going to be sunk. Security, 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 and security. I, you know, the New York Stock Exchange crashed yesterday. So no one is going to have a perfect system for three hours. Um, no one is going to have a perfect system. Um, you know, you know, gigantic multinational called United crashed yesterday for hours stranding 800 airplanes. So, so the idea that you're going to find something that's totally secure is unrealistic. But security is really important, especially when we're dealing with information that is as sensitive as the information that we deal with about our clients. Um, this chart is just from the National Council for Behavioral Health. We are not endorsing anybody. We're just telling you who are the biggest players in the game. And this was as of 2012. So this was the most recent data we were able to get our hands on. But 
you'll see that, you know, NetSmart and Cerner are by far the largest behavioral health related EHR vendors in the country in terms of percentage of organizations that have installed it. But even those two together is barely a quarter. So the field is wide open. And there are, uh, you know, any of you who are at the National Council's conference in Orlando this spring, there had to be 75 EHR companies in the exhibit hall. Um, the, there are so many to choose from. You really need to start by figuring out exactly what it is that you need this system to do, scoping out exactly what you need to have happen at the end, and then go and find somebody who can do, do that for you. You need to make sure that you budget, not just to purchase it, but to maintain it. You know, no, anybody who says to you, oh, just buy the EHR, you don't have to worry about maintenance costs, you should not be in business with because they're starting off the relationship by lying to you. Um, if you can customize it, that's great because the package of services you're providing today may not be exactly the same as the package of services you're going to provide next year or the year after that. And so if you can customize it yourself, or if you have found an EHR vendor that has committed to the state of New York and has committed to make the customizations that are going to reflect the policy changes that happen in the state of New York, that's hugely important. But again, what your organization will develop into in the coming years may not be exactly what you think it's going to develop into in the coming years. So your ability to, to have customizations made just for your organization is gonna be really important. And again, the specific functions, registries, reporting on the, you know, Megan talked a lot about the quality measures before lunch that you're gonna to need to begin to track and report on. If your EHR can't do that for you, you're gonna to have to do it by hand with like, you know, an Excel spreadsheet and that's a terrible way to go if you don't have to. And again, exchanging key inf clinical information. So make sure that you do the work upfront, figure out exactly what you need, figure out what are the processes in your organization that are going to have to change. Um, some, sometimes you have a process which is working really well in your organization, you've really streamlined something and the EHR is gonna force you to break that beautifully streamlined process. Sometimes y'all have paved the cow path and you have a process which meanders around a little bit and the EHR is gonna force you to straighten that out, which is a really positive thing. Um, test it, test it, test it, test it, test it. Have everybody in the agency test it, test it in 11 different ways, do everything you can to test drive this thing as much as possible and to figure out if it's really going to be able to do what the vendor says it's going to be able to do. This may shock you, but it turns out that salespeople sometimes exaggerate the quality of the product they're selling. Um, and again, how is it going to integrate? What are the other systems you already have in place? If you have a billing system that you're not interested in ripping out and replacing, and you're buying an electronic health record, make sure that the electronic health record you buy can integrate with that billing system, can integrate with that accounting system. Because if, if you've got any kind of manual transmission of data, you're gonna have a situation where it's gonna take a really long time, it's gonna use up a lot of human resource, and there are gonna be a lot of errors introduced because as awesome as your staff are, they will make mistakes. Once you have it, you have to do a lot of work to make sure you're using it right and you're getting as much out of it as you can. Um, and you need to make sure that you're, you're providing the support to your staff to do it. You're gonna, you're gonna probably have pretty significant needs for your help desk. You're probably gonna wanna find some super users who think it's super cool and wanna get really into it and wanna be the person that someone calls when they're stuck. Um, Figure out how to do that, whether you're building that in-house, whether you're outsourcing that, whether it's some combination, you're gonna need to figure out how to maintain this um, product once you buy it. But if you don't remember anything else, just remember that you shouldn't buy it at all until you've really, 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 really done your due diligence, even if you're working on top of the due diligence that the state is gonna do on our behalf. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to Meg to talk about value propositions. Okay. So this is, a, this is an example of uh, an instance where we talk a little bit about the culture change that not just you but many in the healthcare system are undergoing and what it means to actually think about your services and program as a brand, as something you market, as something that's moving more into, I have this incredible product that I can bring a lot of value to individuals who have some significant needs. In some cases, your customer is the managed care organization. And they don't know you right now. At least many of them don't know many of you. You may have some relationships. You may have some contracts. But in many cases, they don't know who you are. They don't know what differentiates you from anyone else. And they don't know why they should buy services from you rather than some other agency or at all. And so part of what your responsibility is to your program and to the people you serve to continue delivering those services is to be able to articulate the value that you bring that's unique to you, what you do that's special and different, um, the value you're adding to the lives of the consumers that you're, you're serving, and the ways that you can help manage care actually continue to generate that value. So part of what you all do, and many of you do very, very well already, which again, the healthcare system could learn a lot from the behavioral health sector is about customer experience. Thinking about the people you serve also as a set of customers and the experience they have. When we talk about recovery oriented care and we talk about environments that are physically friendly and welcoming and make people feel like human beings and like they're respected and like they um, are walking into bright, well lit, well decorated, um, environments or home-like environments where they're getting respite and support and supportive housing. So um, these are the kinds of things that um, make the customer experience in different and important and help people continue to come back. Then you have the results. I've hammered this in. Josh has hammered it in a little bit. We won't beat the dead horse any further, but articulating these results and outcomes through data about the quality that you're delivering. And then what are you the best at that no one else, or maybe you know others do well too, but you really, maybe there's a subset of the population you serve. Maybe there's a particular language capacity or cultural competence that you have. Or maybe there's a certain age group that you really figured out how to meet their needs and you do a better job than anybody else on, on meeting those needs. Those are the kinds of things that make you completely invaluable to a managed care organization and filling their network needs, what they want. And again, coming back to this notion of network adequacy, you're going to hear a lot more in the coming months because the um, CMS is continuing to issue updates and revisions to the managed care regulations that govern network adequacy. They are demanding that managed care demonstrate to states and that state establish very, very clear standards about sufficient access, and that includes linguistic competency, cultural competency, geographic um, proximity. So they need, not only do they need a bunch of behavioral health providers to have a good network, they need providers who have Spanish speaking peers who are in a certain county in the state who are within a geographic proximity to the people who need those services. And so thinking about what you do and how to articulate that very, very clearly is part of your value proposition. So quickly, we're going to go through the steps of creating a value proposition. So as you demonstrate your value proposition, the first thing that you're going to do is define the problem or the need that you're meeting, the thing that you're serving, the, the, the gap that you're filling, whatever it is that when you say, here is what we're trying to accomplish as an organization, this is deeply tied to your mission, um, what you're trying to do, the needs of, your, of the clients that you're trying to meet, that's the first piece. Then. How is what you're doing unique, compelling, and innovative? You have a story to tell. You have probably hundreds and thousands of stories to tell of, of all the services you've delivered and the people you've helped and the impact that you've had on their lives. Um, don't be afraid to use those stories to talk about those stories and demonstrate very real um, impact that you can have for them. And then, course, measuring it. And this is not just about outcomes. It's about can you do it more efficiently than somebody else can do it? Can you 
what can you do um, that maybe is a little cheaper or a little better? Um, if you can build a better mousetrap, that's the sort of business analogy that everybody has. But um, who knows, maybe you become the Uber of peer behavioral health services in, in Albany, New York, or the next. And I say that because innovation is really, really important, and we don't talk about innovation in that way in this sector quite the same way that they do in other sectors. But it's not actually just sufficient anymore either to continue doing what we've been doing all along. Um, we, I used, we used to have this joke, um, I, I come from government, and we used to say, you know, what, what's the definition of a bad bureaucrat? And it's buying the same services over and over and over again and expecting a different result. And so we, and so the purchasers can't do that. And so they're looking for you to bring them ideas and innovations. And I bet you you're doing them. I bet you there are innovative services being delivered in every program represented in this room. But if you're not telling people, if you're not measuring the impact they're having, and if you're not describing it to managed care, then nobody knows. And you're quietly doing wonderful work, and that's a great, but um, you need to be able to market it to your future funders. And quite frankly, what that means is if they're willing, if they get excited about buying those services from you, those innovative services, you have the possibility to grow. And I feel like that in some ways, that's like a dirty word in our, our world because people think that um, attempting to grow means you're you know, taking over other agencies or you're focused on um, a, you know, a business plan that um, is a lot of rhetoric that we don't frequently use. But in, in this world, the potential as managed care um, takes over f paying for some of these services. They are going to drive the purchase of valuable services. If the services are, gonna, are working, then they're going to want more of them, and they're going to buy more of them, and they're going to need buy more of them from you, and that's going to create opportunities for some of you to expand the amazing work you're doing to reach even more people. So evaluating impact. We talked a little already about the different types of quality measures. These are just different types of measures that are also important when you think about your value proposition. Sometimes it's a process measure, something that you're doing really, really well, like retaining people and services. Maybe your services are so engaging and your staff are so wonderful and welcoming that people keep coming back, right? We hear a lot that individuals come to first visits, second visits, they come and they get in the door and they never, and then they don't do a good job of coming back regularly and staying engaged. Maybe you do that better than anybody else. Maybe you're productive, and in this world, that's not a dirty word either. Being able to be efficient and have the people that are gonna be billing for the services get a lot of those services in, in a shorter period of time because they're not doing a lot of um, extensive paperwork or burdensome requirements, or you found ways to really make sure that you're streamlining workflows for them so that they can spend the majority of their time doing what they should be doing, which is direct work with the individuals, then that might be something the outcomes we all know about and talk about ad nauseum, but things like the actual reduction in substances that are used, um, real actual outcomes that you can demonstrate for those people. Efficiency, and this is about maybe what you, maybe you get the same number of people placed in housing as the agency down the road, but maybe you do it in a lot shorter time period. There's something there to be gleaned and something there to market. And then cost effectiveness, of course, which is you might all prevent hospitalizations, but how much it costs for each preventable hospitalization is something that your funders are going to really, really care about and makes you particularly valuable to them. In order to demonstrate your value proposition, you have to know your total cost of care. Spoiler alert, it's not the bottom line of your contract. Um, the amount of money that government is currently paying you to run your program, I guarantee you, is not the total cost of your program. Um, I know that because for, in many cases, though that total cost of, of that contract has not increased in 10, 15, 20 years, and the costs have certainly gone up. So what we've done as an industry is we have essentially lied about the cost of, collectively, we've all agreed to lie about the cost of delivering services and to say that they're only that amount that you get in your contract, but in the, but meanwhile you're cobbling it together with fundraising and your um, every you know duct tape and and chicken wire and stringing things together and keeping things running for much lower cost than really it should cost to deliver that quality service. So really understanding the actual cost of delivering the care, making sure that you're 
distributing your overhead and your administrative costs appropriately across programs and services, really looking at how much does it take to keep this service running, to how much does it cost to deliver the next service. If I'm currently delivering 100 units of service and it costs me $100,000, what does that 101st unit of service cost me to deliver? It's not the way that we traditionally think about our costs in this because traditionally government says, don't really care what your costs are. Here's, here's you get $100,000 a year and be happy with it and figure out how to cram your costs and keep serving the same number of people year after year into that $100,000. Um, but without knowing your actual total costs of delivering the service, you're not gonna be able to accurately describe your value proposition to anybody because that's gonna be your denominator for an awful lot of the work that you're doing. So make sure you're taking into account all of these things, everything, all the costs, um, and just be very cognizant of the fact that um, you're gonna probably have to do some forensic work to really get at your true unit costs and your true cost of doing business. So in your workbook, there's a brief value proposition statement for your agency. We gave you our example. We made ourselves do the homework first before we made you do it. So to just demonstrate that we um, have done our due diligence too, we described it. But we want you to take a minute and to define your target customers as specifically as you can. What is unique about the people you're serving? Then define the specific problem or need. If what you're doing is trying to keep young adults out of the juvenile justice system by engaging them in rehabilitative services, or um, then that's what you should say. If you're trying to help people to reduce homelessness or improve their housing stability, be as specific as you can be. Your unique solution, really think about what you do that's different than everybody else. Why is it that what you do is really working well? And then um, what you do that you know is better, and the important part of this better is that how do, you, how do you know? How do you know it's better? Do you know? Do you know how many housing placements the other housing agencies in the state if you are, how many placements they're doing? And do you know if, how you compare or benchmark against your colleagues? Maybe they have more that might not necessarily be good or bad, but if you don't know, think about how are the ways that you measure whether or not you're delivering better service. If not better than the agency down the road that may be better than your 2014 performance. So take a minute or two, I'll walk around if people have questions, but please take a, make an effort to fill this out for your agency and let me know, or just raise if your hand if you have any issues. And then we're gonna actually have people walk around, or I'm gonna walk around and people will give us some of their value propositions. some examples of some value propositions. Who wants to brag about their agency and give me a value proposition of what you're doing? Anybody? Need a little post-lunch energy. I need some volunteers. All right, Carla. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to have you close your eyes and point soon. This crowd is so much shyer than Syracuse and New York. I don't know what it is about the Albany crowd. Everybody there was... Anybody back here? I, I haven't picked on this table yet. Anybody have a value proposition they want to share? You're going to get mad at ours. I will not. I promise not to get mad. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Our, our, some, our, some people are nervous. I know your name. Okay. <laughs> our target, our tar target customer is anyone who... Oh, Wait, boy. hang on. <laughs> Thank you. This is a, probably against everything that um, managed care would want us to do, but any, um, our target customers, anyone who walks through the door who wants to enhance a part of their life. Okay. <laughs> That's why I didn't want to tell you. <laughs> I'm really glad that you said that um, because that's, a, that's great. That can be your target population. Then, and we just had a great conversation over here in the corner talking about um, some of the very, um, very uh, ideological or philosophical recovery-based services, peer-driven services, and the tensions of doing some of this. And we're gonna get into a little bit thinking about you know, what you can compromise on as an agent, agency or provider and what you're not willing to we and what that means. We are a peer support means. provider, by the way. 
Okay, so that's great. So I think I don't I, I don't think there's anything anything at all wrong, even from a managed care point standpoint of what you said. I think the challenge is then finding what's the overlap between what they need to do and what you're doing. And where does it come together and where do you have a shared goal and where are you actually, you know, working towards some of the same outcomes? It's not going to be a complete overlap. There's definitely, you know, parts of what you do that will not be compatible with what they're able to buy and what they're looking for and parts of what they do that are not going to be compatible with what you do and, and that's okay. It doesn't have to be a perfect, perfect match, but I would bet you that there's more overlap than initially appears to be and sort of working through and thinking with them about what that is. I can tell you that in talking to a number of managed care organizations around the country, one of the really cool things is that um, they're doing an increase all over the country, both because they're being required by states through the RFP and RFQ process, but also because they're recognizing the absolute value of it. They're hiring peers as staff within their own organizations in order to, to drive that culture. And they're absolutely purchasing a lot more peer services and driving a lot more peer support. And this is happening in places you wouldn't, you'd be surprised or in different, it's happening in Georgia and Hawaii and Michigan. There's a whole bunch of places where, um, that, where they're really pushing some of the boundaries around peer support. So I, I don't think it's as, odd, as at odds as it once was with the, some of the managed care ideas. Value proposition, I need two more and then I'll leave you alone. Uh, got one. Two got more. One, got one, got one. Got I'll one? Give you, I'll give you one. All right. We're a licensed home care agency, and we do a lot with the waiver programs. So we, we really just place PCAs. We are licensed to do HHAs. We spend a lot of time and money invest in additional training in the PCA population to handle TBIs because okay. a regular level PCA is not going to go out there and do a good job at that. Okay. So we've increased in services, increased training to them, a lot more support from the RN staff. And okay. we've taken on a great, a larger population of those cases. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that one of the important pieces of value added that you do is you do a lot of investment in workforce. Mm -hmm. What you're really doing is making sure the workforce that you're supporting is trained and delivering high quality service. Yes. And that, that subset of the population that you're serving that has TBI is a definite complex population with a lot of different needs and not a ton of services out there. So that is definitely a niche. And that value added that you can bring to that work, incredibly important. That would be a great, great value proposition to share. Thank you. Anybody else? One more. You want to try? No. <laughs> <laughs> Such a tip. All right. I'm going to pick on you folks over here. Okay. All right, let's go. Here we go. Here we go. I get to be the speaker. Uh, let's see. Our agency serves adults and children in our two counties impacted by mental health issues in developing a healthier and more successful life. Okay. Can you, I, I'll, I'm, I'll pick on you a yeah, little sure. bit. I'm going to leave this with you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> How do you know? How do you know that? the value and the impact that you're having for people. You said you're helping them live better lives. How, mm -hmm. how do you know that? Um, well, I mean, obviously outcome measures. Right? No, um, so I actually personally run a pros. Um, so I, through anecdotally, know through clients that they're clearly living in ways that they weren't living when they came to us. You know, okay. whether it's just they've been out of the hospital for all that time or their first job. Um, one of them literally doesn't want to kill anybody anymore. That's a good thing. Um, but we're not great at always measuring it in a way that we could say to a managed care, here's how many people we've kept out of the hospital. Here's how many people we have working, that kind of thing. Okay. So you have a really compelling story. Mm -hmm. Bolstering it with some data would be make it that much stronger. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. So All right. We're going to get into the infrastructure question. So we've now laid out for you throughout the course of today a lot of things that are going to change and need to be done. Now we're actually going to work, talk to you about potential solutions. So I think you need that. In, I just have to say in New York we had to cut that piece of the thing off because everybody wanted a chance to talk about how awesome their agency is. I don't know why Albany is so shy. 
we have spoken over the course of the day about a lot of the different processes, people, infrastructure that you're going to need in order to succeed in a Medicaid managed care environment. Um, and I think we started the day by saying it's either a Medicaid managed care environment or not at all. Um, so I hope that by now you're all interested in, in succeeding in a Medicaid managed care environment and acknowledging that there's some some infrastructure, some underpinnings of your organization that you don't have that you need to figure out how to get. And I had a little bit of a conversation about the simple math of the situation. Um, and the math of the situation, especially for a small provider, is tough. Here is a list of all of the different sort of infrastructural needs for a behavioral health care organization. And I have put in bold those needs which either are um, created by or exacerbated by a move to a managed care environment. Um, there are, all of these are things that your organization is going to need to be able to do in order to survive and thrive in a managed care environment. Um, and some of these things you're going to have to do by January 1st of 2016, you know, so like six months, I'm sorry, July 1st of 2016. Um, so like set, you know, 12 months from now, and some of them you're, you're, you really have essentially from now three years to develop, but you will need all of them by the time July 1st of 2018 comes along and you're on your own essentially in a managed care environment. And now you should all stop and thank the folks from the state agencies who have given you this two year period to really get up to speed because if you had to have it all by July 1st of 16, it would be a really tough road to hoe. Here is the problem, and it's a simple math problem, and we discussed this at the table behind. Here is just a list of some of the, some of the infrastructure you need in order to survive in a managed care environment. And let me be clear, this assumes you already have a functioning agency. You already have an HR person. You already have a CEO. You already have a CFO. They're all, you already have an organization which is running. This is new stuff you need in order to survive in a managed care environment. You need a billing manager, a contracting and credentialing manager. You need a database administrator and a data analyst and a quality improvement director and a financial analyst, a compliance officer. You need a billing system, an EHR, you need space. We did a very back of an envelope for this. And we came up with, eh, call it $750,000 worth of infrastructure. Now, if your administrative overhead rate is 15% and you need somewhere between, say, half a million and three quarters of a million dollar of new infrastructure development, that means you're going to need to be billing three to four to maybe five million dollars of Medicaid managed care in order to support that infrastructure. Now, as, uh, as we pointed out about the, the peer provider Inc. that we made up, they're a two and a half million dollar agency. And not all of that is going to convert to Medicaid managed care. So they're going to come up a couple of million bucks short of the revenue they need to support the infrastructure that they need. That's not an ideological contention. That's just math. Um, now, maybe you can pinch a nickel here, a nickel there. Maybe your admin overhead rate is not 15%. It's only 12%. Maybe your fringe rate is a little bit lower than whatever we use to calculate. The number is not going to be specific to your organization, but the construct I think you're going to find is pretty similar. And so you now have a problem. You need a bigger infrastructure than you can afford. I'm sorry, Nikki, am I giving you a headache? <laughs> um, you need a bigger infrastructure than you can afford. And you need to figure out how to get it sometime in the next, call it, three years. So you're, in order to get this infrastructure, you have a, a bunch of options. Do you build it yourself? Do you try to grow your way out of the problem? Do you try to expand your service portfolio enough that now you're billing, or maybe you already are big enough that you're gonna be billing four, five, six million dollars of Medicaid managed care? in which case the challenge is just building the infrastructure. Or are you not that big and you don't think you're gonna get that big and so you need to find some other way to get it. You can try to buy it 
And there are lots of different ways to buy it, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. But buying that infrastructure comes with a set of challenges, right? There are problems of control. There are problems of marginal cost. There are problems of specialization in the long-term financial viability of your organization. If you're going to outsource it, which is a great way to do it, because maybe you don't need a full-time billing clerk, and so you can outsource to a billing company who will happily sell you, you know, 20% of a billing clerk's time. Um, but if you do that, what exactly are you going to outsource? Which portion of it? To whom are you going to outsource it? And how are you going to oversee this outsourcing? Because just because you hired somebody to do it for you doesn't mean you have solved your problem. They might be great at it. They might not. So, yes. So the question for those of you who might not have heard it is, isn't that what's happening in the healthcare system? This is why there are so many hospital mergers. This is why there's essentially not left anywhere in New York State, at least that I can think of right now, a single hospital that stands on its own. That's why almost every hospital in New York City has a sign out front that says Mount Sinai, St. Luke's Roosevelt. Um, merger is one way to develop the scale necessary to compete. And hospitals, hospital, the hospital industry has figured out the scale they need to compete is billions of dollars. Uh, no one is suggesting that community-based behavioral health agencies need to be billion-dollar en entities, although if they were, they would have really good infrastructures. Um, but the question of merger is certainly a question and is certainly something that I think any CEO of any community-based behavioral health organization should at least be pondering. I'm not saying merge, I'm saying you should at least be considering it, and we'll talk in just a minute about what some of those considerations are. Um, but before you get to merger, there are other options for developing the infrastructure that you might need that are less, um, let's say, less drastic than a merger. Um, there are back office collaborations where you say, you're going to run your agency and I'm going to run my agency, but we're going to share an HR department. We're going to share a billing department. I, you know, now I've got twice as much scale if I'm, if I'm sharing a back office with a similarly sized organization. Now, there are challenges there, of course. You, know, are you, you really want to share an HR department with your competitor down the road? You know, when the really great candidate shows up, who's going to get her. Um, there are opportunities to establish new collaborative entities. You create a third party entity to provide support to either two or three or four or five or seven of you. All the organizations in Columbia County can get together and create some, you know, an organization to provide the back office and we're going to talk about that a little bit. There are strategic partnership opportunities where you say I'm not quite ready to merge but I see that my interests are very much aligned with the interests of the agency across the way and we're going to enter into a strategic partnership. Maybe we'll share some space. Maybe we'll share some infrastructure. Maybe we found an, an EHR system that we can share, and in doing so, dramatically reduce the cost that each of us has to spend on an EHR system. The question that I feel very strongly you should be asking first and foremost is how do we provide the best possible services to the people that we serve. The key question at the end of the day is whether or not you're able to provide really high quality services to the people you want to serve. Everything else is detail. Everything else is a tactical decision once you've figured out the strategic question of how you're going to be able to do that. What are some of the considerations that you should be thinking about if you're thinking about merging? It, ain't, it isn't free. It isn't quick. It isn't easy. There are questions of control and organizational identity, and we've been called X 
for 60 years and we're not gonna change our name. There are questions of ego, let's be honest. I'm the CEO. I don't wanna be the COO of a big organization. I'm the CEO. Um, there are questions of startup. There are legal complications. There are governance questions because if you think CEOs have egos, talk to board chairs. And there, are the, the, and there are the questions of how you're going to achieve the critical mass that you need to achieve the economy of scale. Now, if you're thinking about merging with somebody, I beg you, I urge you, I plead with you to start with values. First, look for people who share your values. Look for people who understand their role in the way you do. If you believe in recovery and you try to merge with an organization that doesn't, it's a road to sadness. It's a road to suffering. Don't go down it. Start by finding people who share your values. That's, that, that's the one thing that you can't compromise on. Because that's really who you are as an entity. That's really what makes your agency your agency. The name out front is not what makes your agency your agency. The values you infuse the care you provide with is what makes you who you are. But there are lots of other questions around culture and around cost and around workforce and are they unionized in your not? Not a small consideration, let's be clear. And control. There may be antitrust issues, although the organizations in this room tend to be the smaller ones, so I don't think you're gonna run into those. The question of horizontal versus vertical integration, this is something that I think a lot of folks in our industry have trouble with, because we think like social workers, not like business people. Um, we tend to wanna merge with people who will help us fill out our continuum of care, because we're thinking about the people that we serve, which is great. But if we have one clubhouse and one housing program and one clinic and one employment program, every program we run is the prototype. The prototype is always the most expensive, most difficult to operate. If I run a housing agency and I merge with another housing agency, now I have generated really significant economies of scale because everybody involved is good at running housing. And, and we, don't have one pro, we don't have a whole bunch of prototypes. We have one prototype and a whole bunch of replicas of it. And now we have generated the potential for real savings. It's a different way of thinking about mergers than this industry has tended to think about them. But I think it's a really important consideration. If I'm running a clinic and I'm looking for somebody to merge with, I want to find somebody else who's running a clinic because then when we buy an EHR together, we just need to find an EHR that can serve clinic and we're going to save a lot of money this way. Um, questions of governance, always very complicated. And ultimately, and I, you know, I think it's about excellence. The question is what do you as an organization need to do to be excellent? Sure. I, I mean, I understand the concept, but I just don't see it as black and white. So, Edie, it's not, it's not black and white, and if I, if I colored it black and white, I apologize. It was an overstatement. There are economies to, of scale to be gained by merging with people who have a different service portfolio than you do. Because you all still need an HR department. You all still need an IT department. You all still need a chief operating officer. You all still need a chief financial officer. So there are some economies of scale. But if two housing providers merge, or you know, two organizations, let's say, that both have housing and clubhouse. There used to be two directors of housing and two directors of clubhouse services. Now you just need one director of housing and one director of clubhouse services. If two organizations merge, one has housing and clubhouse and the other has clinic and employment, 
you still need a director of housing, a director of clubhouse services, a director of clinic services, and a director of employment services. You haven't generated as much economy of scale. There is still economy of scale to be had, and there is something to be said for a service continuum that includes all four of those things, and that's not to be underestimated. But if you're looking at, at making a business decision for the purposes of generating the economies of scale that you're going to need to operate and succeed in the new business environment, the more you can generate, the more leverage you can get, the more you can say, I am a huge housing provider here in Onondaga County. Now a managed care company has absolutely no choice but to do business with you because they need housing in Onondaga County. So you've given yourself economies of scale and leverage, um, which is not to say that other ways don't get you some economies of scale. It's just a question of how much economy of scale you're generating. Yes, and, and what is going to end up making you attractive to a payer is really important. Go ahead, Edie. So I'm going to push it a little bit further. I think that, um, you know, and I come from a background where I'm a provider and a manager, I mean a clinician and a manager at the same time. So I think what turns a lot of people off in social services is thinking about business propositions without thinking about the human side of it. So I think that when we weigh the economies of scale we produce, I think we also have to weigh the other issues that go into the provision of behavioral health services. So if we pull together all of the housing services in a particular area, we're really um, limiting choice. And so do we really want to do that? Will we get enough ROI for pulling that stuff together and being able to sell ourselves to a managed care company to warrant the reduction of choice. So I think for us, the decisions become even more complex because we want to make the right business decision, but we want to make sure that the outcome of that business decision is still going to be the provision of a recovery-oriented service that allows for um, choice and, um, you know, and uh, um, geographical ease of access. So I think that our decisions in some ways are even more complex. Now, I don't know the business world, so I shouldn't say that. Oh, no, but, I, um, I totally but I know the business world of behavioral health, and I think that it's a very complex one for us. First of all, I totally agree with you that our decisions are more complex. Business decisions, pure business decisions, are easy. You only have one outcome metric. How much money are you making? Um, it's simple. Um, our, our decisions are much more complex. We have many more bottom lines than that. Um, the question of limiting choice is when you get into antitrust issues. We are so far from that at this point in our service system in New York that I don't think we have, I don't think we are, we are so far away from having a single provider who's controlling all of the housing in any geography that, that you know, and that if we got to that point, then that's when antitrust issues come up. And that's when the state agencies begin to say, no, you can't merge. I need, I need at least two housing providers in Onondaga County. Um, what I don't think we should lose, what I think is important that we not lose, is the question of quality. Um, it's really hard to run one housing program. It's really hard to have one housing program that's really good. It's a lot easier to provide a really high quality housing program if you have six or 10 or 15 because you're learning things from all of them that you're spreading to each of them. Um, and that's just the reality. And I, I come from, you know, over the course of my career, I've worked at an agency where we had 1,000 beds and I worked at an agency where we had 20 beds. And we did the very best we could with those 20 beds, but we were swimming upstream. And at the end of the day, those 20 beds were not as nice as the beds that we were providing at the agency where we were providing 1,000 of them because we had so much economy of scale to leverage. The maintenance people, the leasing people, the renovations people who were working in 75 houses instead of one, the renovations that happened at the one was me and my spare time, and I am not handy. Um, so. 
the, you're, we have to protect consumer choice, and I totally agree with you, but we're a long way away from monopolies in our behavioral health system. There are over 200 providers of behavioral health services in New York City alone. Um, so someday we may have to worry about that, but I just don't think we're there yet. Um, and I'm not saying when you're merging, only look for other providers who have the same service portfolio as you do. But what I'm saying is when you're thinking about a merger, a provider who has a per service portfolio similar to yours offers a lot of potential opportunities to both save money and improve quality. And I know that we all want to provide high quality services. I know that we all want the people we serve to have access to really high quality, really excellent care. And we want to be able to provide that for them. Was there a question over here? I don't know if it's a question or more of a statement. So the two counties that I've worked in essentially have one care provider. You have one clinic, you have one housing provider, um, maybe one social club, and there hasn't been, there is no competition. You know, if you want housing in, in X county, you have to go through this particular agency. Because of that, the agencies tend to be smaller. And so some of these things seem daunting. Daunting, yes. And it, look, if there, if there are places where there's really only one provider, um, that speaks to a, a volume of service that, it can't, that can't support larger agencies. Um, and that's just a, a, you know, that's a rural reality, I guess, in a lot of parts of the state and a lot of parts of the country. Um, but that, the, the volume question is not one that we're gonna be able to change, right? If there, if there are only 60 people in the county who need housing, there are only 60 people in the county who need housing, government has a question at that point. Are we better off with one provider providing 60 beds or two providers providing 30 beds? Is that competition producing value in a meaningful way? Or are we better off with one who's providing 60 and is providing 60 beds at a higher quality than the two who are providing 30? That's a, that's a question for regulators. Um, and there may be a point where regulators want to step in and say, you guys need to split up. I don't see that happening in our behavioral health system anytime soon. I, I, I just, I, I don't see that as a reality for our system, which has hundreds and hundreds of providers, some of whom are very small agencies. And a very small agency, based on the math, is going to have a really hard time surviving, much less thriving, in a, in a managed care environment. Um, and and that's, that's just a reality. So you all as agency executives need to figure out how do we get from here to there? How do we get from whoever we are today, whatever we are today, to a different organization, to an organization that has access to the resource that we need to manage the complexities of the service system that we're moving into. And ultimately, that is what the question you all need to be asking is. And part of that question is about what are you willing to change? And the flip side of that is what are you not willing to change? What do you have to protect? What is it that your organization has to protect as we move into the new world? this last question that you raised where there may be some geographies where there might be a single provider because and this we're we're looking at this and seeing this in places as Josh mentioned around the country what it does is actually also position you differently vis-a-vis -vis managed care because the demands and the negotiations and your relationship with them is going to look different than when you're in a uh, um, geography where there's multiple competing providers, whether it's five or 500 or whatever it is. Be and so those conversations will look very differently because they need you and you need them. And so that partnership and how you meet the needs and how you also, um, you know, meet their requirements in addition to what can they do and be flexible with, with you and how, how can they work with you to support you. Those are the kinds of questions. I and mean, that conversation will probably look a little differently than it would if you were in, in a more dense 
provide our uh, geography. And so um, if you want, that's another thing that if people are running into that situation, we could also talk a little offline about what we've seen in other geographies in the country and, and some creative ways to partner with managed care in those instances. So to come back to the data that we looked at at the very beginning of the day, um, the, the single, the question on which you all expressed the least comfort was the question of a strategic plan that accounts for these changes. Um, and so what we're gonna try to do now is talk about what some of those considerations are and then work with you on thinking about what some of the first steps towards that strategic plan might be. But first, we're gonna answer this question in the back. Um, what was on my mind is when we were talking about um, the difference between uh, large programs and what seemed to be your perspective that the larger um, a program is, oftentimes the better quality it is. And then you gave this um, sort of description of how there's more resources financially to paint the walls, to make the place look pretty. Um, my experience, and I know the, the experience of many uh, providers that are smaller is that being smaller often connects you into the values of what you're doing more effectively. And I think it's really important as you guys do all of this that, that there is some sort of um, appreciation or communication about the importance of, of providing services in a values-driven way. You know, Edie brought up choice. Choice is a, is a value of a peer support organization. It's first and foremost most important. To me, saying that, you know, bigger is better is, first of all, just ridiculous because it's often you, the bigger you get, the more you lose sight of your values, of your mission, of the importance of the people that you serve. But more importantly, that's the exact reason why most peer support providers and most peers are very nervous about the managed care environment is because of the idea that bigger is better and, um, and, and, it, and that the more you have, um, the better you are if you can paint a wall. When what's your definition of quality is the bottom line. I think that's what needs to be at the bottom line of this conversation. What's your definition of quality? Thank you, I, I totally agree. Um, and I, you know, bigger, bigger is not better. And when I, you know, what I said was, if you're thinking about getting bigger, start with the values. Um, because the values are what make you who you are. The values are what make your services what they are. Um, there is a math problem that is inescapable. Um, and the question for small peer run agencies and for organizations that feel like if they get too big, they're gonna lose touch. Now, I, I would question that contention. I have seen larger organizations that have maintained contact with their values because they have baked that into their cake successfully. And Yes, and, and every one of these that we have ever done, I have said the same thing, that it's, it's the values that make you who you are. It's the values that make your services work. Um, it's the values that make your, you know, one of, the triple, one of the three aims in the triple aim is about the experience of the people you serve. The people you serve know what your organization's values are, whether you tell them or not. The people you serve know what your organization's values are, not because they read them on your wall, but because they experience them every day, because they live them. Because when they walk in, your values are what they feel. And it's not about paint. Paint helps, but it's about the, the texture of the service that you provide. So I, I absolutely think that that's a critical question. The challenge, and one of the things that I'll, I think I actually say on my next slide, the challenge is figuring out how to Solve the math problem without losing sight of your values. How to solve the math problem without sacrificing what makes your organization special. I, mean, I, I think the other issue, especially for behavioral health care, you know, in the field of medicine is, you know, coming up with metrics. What is value? How, is value that someone who in your program will not be hospitalized for three years, two years. Well, it's very hard in behavioral health care to really come up with, to measure values as you may be in other areas of medicine. And, and we, have, we have done a great job, I think, in our field of 
translating some of the metrics, and Megan talked about this earlier today, how all of a sudden the healthcare system is looking at things like employment. The healthcare system is looking at things like incarceration. The healthcare system is looking at things like housing that we have always said is important and that they never paid any attention to. Um, and that, to my mind, speaks to a, a point where we were finally being heard by the healthcare system that found it really easy for a long time to stick us off to the side and forget about us. And that's what I said, this is our moment. Right now, with all of the transformation underway, with all of the upheaval, we have our chance to plant our flag and to plant the flag of recovery and to say the, the purpose of behavioral health services is not to keep people in behavioral health services for the rest of their life. The purpose of behavioral health services is to get people back on their feet so they can get back to their life. And if we succeed, then that will be what the, what the healthcare system understands about behavioral health services. It's not easy. But the math problem you keep referring to, as I heard it, is if you're less than a $5 million, you know, an agency with less than a $5 million annual budget, you can't bill Medicaid. But yet there are agencies with less than a $5 million annual budget that successfully bill Medicaid. I mean, and, and I understand that, that all of those various things need to be paid attention to, but all of those various things don't need a $100,000 a year position associated with them. That is strange. That, that math problem doesn't add up. So let me, let me. And causes a, a conflict with the values because you're not going to be able to keep the values that you're looking at. And however, like 12 people on staff, the salary like that, if, if that's your sort of bottom line of your math problem, then those two things don't add up. So, so let me be clear. Billing Medicaid, and the agency I work for used to run a pros program, billing Medicaid is not hard. Dealing with a Medicaid-managed care company is a totally different calculus, a totally different undertaking than billing Medicaid. We were able to run a pros program. I didn't have to have a contract with a managed care company. I didn't have to have a particularly robust EHR system. I could, I could use foothold that, that I got from the state. There were so many things that you don't have to do to bill Medicaid that you're going to have to do to deal with Medicaid-managed care. And remember, you're not going to be able to deal with a Medicaid-managed care company. You're going to have to deal with all of the Medicaid-managed care companies that provide coverage to the people that you want to serve. So like I said. Uh, the math we did was back of an envelope. Maybe it's $3 million. Uh, maybe it's $5 million. Maybe it's $8 million. You need to do that math yourself. And you need to look at your salary structures and your admin overhead rates and your fringe rates and your rents, and you need to figure out what is the scale that I need to be. And you may find out that you're there, which is great. You may find out that you're not, in which case that's when you need to begin to ask the question, of how am I going to get the infrastructure I need to have? 